Welcome to the mysterious world of Paranormal M. Prepare yourself for tales that defy explanation. Subscribe and turn on notifications to join us on our journey into the unexplained. Secondhand Furniture This was about a year and a half ago, and also when I had to move into an apartment with a friend. It was a small one-bedroom apartment, and it was technically a converted attic in a very old house. My roommate, R, spent most of her time in the apartment directly below where her boyfriend and my bandmate, D, lived. I would spend a lot of time upstairs in the attic alone. She was able to supply most of the furniture that we used, but my family is also very thrifty, and I buy anything second-hand if I can. One day when I was visiting my folks, my mom brought a black side table that she had found at a local thrift store. She was going to try to sell it because it was very old and had a real big light handle. But it was like the perfect size for my apartment and was only two dollars. So she let me take it home with me. The day I took it home and cleaned it out, I could tell that something was off. I'm a pretty empathetic person. I can feel when things aren't right, even if I can't really explain why or how I know that. The table is about three feet tall and had a small drawer on the top, and from the drawer down to the bottom was a large sort of cabinet space. There was no door, so it was just kind of open. I remember looking into that space and feeling uneasy for some reason, like it was too dark for the amount of light that was in the room. Or maybe it was too big of a space for such a small table. I could not really put my finger on it, but I did clean it anyway, and I placed it between the futon and the living room and the door to the bedroom on its left. It wasn't long before the odd feeling began to be justified. One day I was walking out of the bedroom into the living room. Right after I crossed the threshold next to the table, I heard a growl. Let it be known, I am very aware of audio and visual matrixing. I immediately tried to recreate the noise by walking on the wood floor again in the same spot. I tried every spot in that space. None of it squeaked or made any sort of noise. In fact, for how old the house was, the floors were very solid. They were well, making hardly any noise at all. But... I had heard a growl, and it was to my left in the space where the table stood. I brushed it off and continued as normal for a couple of weeks until one day when I was about to leave the apartment. I had turned on the light that illuminated the stairwell leading down to the front door, and that's when I realized I'd forgotten something. I went into the bedroom to grab it, and when I came back out, the light was off. I checked the switch immediately. But it was one of those, you know, weird, another switch at the bottom of the stairs kinds of things. So sometimes even when it's switched on, it might actually be off because the one at the bottom was technically switched off. I couldn't remember which way I had flipped it, decided it could have been wiring problems. I brushed it off again and went on as normal for a bit longer. Little things like that happened pretty consistently for a couple of months but it was never enough to make me feel like anything substantial was actually happening. I just grew more and more uneasy. Could never really fully close a door. I slept with the bedroom door open, showered with the bathroom door open. I always felt watched, but I had no evidence to support it. One hot summer day I was alone in the apartment, in the bedroom recording some music. I had the door closed because the window AC unit in the living room was pretty loud. I remember specifically closing the door because I didn't want to have to edit out white noise in the background. I recorded and jammed for about an hour. When I got up to have a pee break, I opened the bedroom door to silence. Walked over to the AC to see if it had been switched off. And mind you, it's not something that can be accidentally switched off. The knobs click into place. They have to be moved with several pounds of force. 
it was not an electrical issue. The knob had been turned. My memory backpedaled. Did I really close the door because the AC or because of downstairs noise? The neighbors are kind of noisy. They tend to slam doors, so maybe that's why I closed mine. I did my business, went back in to record, closing the bedroom door again. Another hour or two passed, I started to pack things up. I opened the bedroom door to head to the kitchen, and guess what was turned back on? The AC unit. The knob had clicked over two spots, from off past low fan all the way down to low cool. I finally felt justified for being uneasy. Something actually happened that I couldn't explain no matter how hard I tried. But I didn't want to worry my friends or family. I decided not to say anything. But I did say some prayers and hoped that whatever was causing this would see itself out. Unfortunately, around this time, I got really sick with mono. I ended up taking about two months off of work. And R&D stayed downstairs pretty much 24-7 to keep away from my germs. My parents didn't really want to visit me or anything, but I went to their house a lot to have dinner. That way I could eat a meal and not just have ramen and pretzels every day. As I was being a potato day in and day out, no longer gone nine hours a day at my desk job, I started to notice more strangeness happening. There was a smell. I'd be laying down watching TV and a whiff of something rotting would come out of nowhere. It would stay for a couple of seconds max. Then it would be gone. I sniffed the futon, I sniffed the floor, the bathroom, the bedroom, even stuck my face down in the kitchen trash. None of it smelled like that. I took the kitchen trash all the way outside. But when I came back in, that quick little waft of hot garbage continued. For weeks, it would just come and go at random. Eventually, I'd found it to be localized to my stairs. There was nothing to cause a smell in the stairwell because there was nothing in the stairwell. What was weird was that as soon as you opened the door and stepped onto the second floor hallway, the smell would be gone. It would be replaced by a smell of dog from Dee's puppy. The first floor smelled like old house and dryer sheets from the basement laundry. One day after I had mostly recovered from the virus, R came upstairs to hang out on the futon and watch YouTube for a while. I told her about some of the things I'd been hearing and seeing. And it turned out that she shared some of the same experiences. All of a sudden on the wall behind us there was a loud knock. Did you hear that? Yeah, that was weird, but this is an old house, so it might have just been wood settling. It sounded like somebody banged on the wall. Yeah, it happens sometimes, I'm sure it's just because we're in the attic. Truthfully, I've never heard that noise before. I've lived in many old houses that settle like that. It was too close to us, too perfect of timing, and way too loud to be a coincidence. And I don't believe in coincidences anyway. One day I was in Dee's apartment chilling with his cat while R quickly went outside with the dog. I was sitting in the kitchen which was directly underneath the living room and bathroom of my apartment upstairs. While I was sitting there I heard slow and heavy footsteps upstairs go from one end of the room to the other. With me on the second floor, R outside, and Dee gone at work. There was no one left to be on the third floor. My apartment was empty. Later, I asked R if she ever heard me walk around up there. She said no. It was like no one lived there. It didn't surprise me because I'm light-footed and I'm a small girl. But it did scare me because I could only imagine how big somebody would have to be to make loud footsteps like that. At this point, I was still deep in post-viral fatigue. I had to quit my job altogether. I was getting ready to move out of the apartment and back home. And that's when one day I got a series of Snapchat videos from R. Dee's cat was going nuts downstairs, jumping at the walls in the hallway. That was between the kitchen and the living room. He was meowing and looking up at the ceiling. 
following something invisible with his eyes into corners. He was even following with his eyes along upper parts of the walls. It went on for several minutes. This cat never meowed and wasn't very playful. He mostly just chilled and slept everywhere. And so R and I are a bit unnerved by the sudden change in behavior. I later realized that where he was freaking out in that hall was directly underneath where my, well, the backside table, excuse me, black side table sat in the attic apartment. All of these things together had become too much for me. My parents helped me move out of my apartment as fast as possible. When I had finally told them everything that was happening, they insisted on helping me gather what I would need for the next couple of days. They would hire movers for the rest of it later. My mom finally opened up to me as we were packing. The reason they never came to visit me was because they get an uneasy feeling every time they came over. She had noticed the smell as well. I couldn't blame her. If I had followed my gut feeling at first, I wouldn't have stayed either. But it just crept up on me so slowly. It seemed to almost gaslight me whenever I questioned my surroundings. That day we made a couple of trips between houses with the gap after lunch for rest. When we went back later in the afternoon, the door to my apartment was wide open. R had been in D's apartment all day, so I asked if she had gone in and maybe forgot to close the door. She said no. She saw that the door was open but figured we were still there. I specifically remember closing and locking the door. My mom does too. She watched me do it. She even described the specific way I stood to lock the door, off to the left with one foot on the stairs, which she wouldn't have known otherwise because she hardly ever visited. At this point, I no longer felt safe. As we were packing up the last day in the apartment, the smell came back. This time, the trash was empty. It had been taken out yesterday. There wasn't even a bag in it. My mom and dad were both there but neither of them could smell it. We got more bags of clothes and blankets, more music gear in my bookcase. As we began to leave, the sky opened up. I know it rains hard in Pennsylvania, but this was torrential. I had a lamp in one hand and my favorite bass guitar in the other with no case. My dad suggested that we wait a minute to let up. It started coming down in buckets. He ran the bookcase out the car anyway. Mom and I waited on the porch. What do we do? I don't know. I didn't know. As we waited, it turned into borderline hurricane levels of wind and rain. The huge trees across the street were bending dangerously. The wind whipped through leaves so hard, sending rain down so fiercely. We basically had to yell to be heard standing right next to each other. It started to rain sideways covering us even under the shelter of the porch. The only way I can describe it is if it was coming from all directions. I could actually see it coming sideways from left, right, and center. The rain covered my glasses. The wind blew so hard that we were pushed back on our heels, almost falling over each other. I want to get out of here. I don't care anymore. As soon as everything was loaded into the car, the wind died down. By the time we got to my parents' house, it was sprinkling. Within an hour, the sun was out. The sky was a vivid, almost cloudless blue. It hadn't clicked with me yet that the side table might have been the clue to everything. So it came home with my parents and me. I remember sitting in the kitchen and telling my mom that I felt like it was staring at me. She said we'd get rid of it as soon as possible. Back to the thrift store it went. A day or two goes by, and my mom makes a trip to see her friend who owns a local antique shop. The woman who owns it has bought the little black end table with the bakelite handle and placed it in a vignette next to the desk, and that's topped with various small vintage pieces, mirrors, cards, terracotta pot with the crown, sort of just sitting inside. My mom warned her about the little table, explaining what had happened to us just previously. During this conversation, they both heard a loud clang. The crown that had been sitting in the pot was lying on the floor, four or five feet away from the table where it rested, as if it had been picked up and flung away. The little black end table was taken back to the thrift store, 
for the final time. Strange Happenings After the Death of a Friend About 11 years ago, a close friend of mine passed away. He was in a horrible head-on collision on the highway after he missed his pills. He blacked out behind the wheel. The first inclination that something was wrong happened in the form of a gut feeling I often get when something horrible like that happens. I get the sense that something is terribly wrong somewhere. I never know why at the time that I feel it. It throws my day off until I hear the news. In this case, the news came to me the following day. However, when I felt it was the night that it happened. Bad feelings aside, I went to visit with one of the usual gang to console with everybody over the news that her friend had passed. I learned that his old roommate had received duplicate texts from him that day. That was hours after his death. Each read exactly. I'm on my way home now. This hit me particularly hard at the time. It still haunts me a bit. One final strange thing about this whole arc of events took place about a year or so later. The last place my friend had been before his death was Toronto. He had been visiting a friend there. He was on his way home when the accident took place. Around a year later I found myself in that city for school. I was walking home one day after roaming around the Eaton Center. I was passing through Dundas Square. This area is normally very busy during the day. This was no exception. I passed by someone as I was walking down the side street, which cut through the university grounds. I caught a glimpse of his face in passing. At first I thought, damn, he looked really familiar. Then it hit me just who it reminded me of. I double took, glanced at him as he walked away, and it struck me that this person was the spitting image of my friend. It could have been coincidence, of course, but that really rattled me. And of course I wasn't going to approach a random person and try to converse with them about, well, something like this out of the blue. The moment stuck with me, though. It was as if I had witnessed his ghost or doppelganger. I heard an animal that doesn't exist. I live with my grandparents and my parents live in an RV parked in the yard. One night I was leaving the RV to go to the house. I heard the strangest noise I'd ever heard. I'll do my best to describe it. It was like a deep wheeze. So at first I actually thought it was my dad having a coughing fit. He's a heavy smoker. So I called out to him with no response. The best I can describe it is like a pig squeal overlapped by the sound of an ape roaring or a goat screaming in pain with like a deep wheeze to the sound. I just stood frozen for a second before I started to feel uneasy as hell. Mind you, it was pitch black outside so I couldn't see a thing. I called out for my dad one more time without moving from my spot. I got no response again. I turned around and ran back to the RV. My mom and brother were directly inside, and I guess they could see the horror on my face because they immediately started asking what was wrong. It all happened so quickly, but I was suddenly shaking and pale. First thing I did was ask where Dad was, the answer to which was in the back sleeping. I was really freaked out at this point, told him about the sound. My family's not crazy religious, but we are Christian, and my mom insisted only a demon could make a sound like that. I had her walk me back to the house that night and every night after for about a month. It left me afraid to go outside at night for quite some time. The strangest thing to me was that we all heard this sound. Yet it filled me with so much fear for so long. 
spent ages researching different animals and the sounds that they make, obviously focusing on animals that frequent my area. I live in South Florida. I found nothing close to the sound I heard. My friend had a haunted apartment. My friend used to live in this apartment that he swore up and down was haunted. He would always tell us stories about hearing noises and objects being thrown from his countertops. We had stayed over on multiple occasions, but never saw anything out of the ordinary. There were even times where we sat in the dark and tried to ask whatever it was to make a noise or move a door. Still, nothing. It eventually got to the point that we just assumed he was messing with us. He would never see or hear anything, but he had all these crazy stories. One night, though, that all changed. We had all gathered at his apartment to stay the night. We were going to an event in the morning and we were going to all ride together. That night we played poker and had some drinks. One of her friends had too much to drink and went to empty his stomach out in the restroom. A ghost was playing with us. Late night summer. There were some families gathered for a birthday party at my friend's farmhouse. Most of the people have already left, but we stayed because our families were good friends. They had set up a fire outside and everybody was gathered around it. There were four of us kids in the group, and we were all around nine or ten or so. Behind the fire gathering there was a medium-sized hill, which us four decided to run up to the top and roll down. We did this a couple of times and enjoyed ourselves. From the top of the hill you could see the farmhouse facing straight forward and off to the side of the hill was a barn. There was a light somewhere near us that allowed it to where our shadows were showing on the side of the barn. We would continue to going up the hill and we'd see our shadows and sometimes try to make little shadow puppets and such. Now here's where the spooky part comes. One of the times that we climbed the hill we decided to try and make letters with our body shadows on the barn wall. We had all lined up four in a row, noticed that there was a fifth shadow on the barn. A little confused, we looked around at each other, looking to see if there was a fifth person up there with us, but there wasn't. I remember looking back at the barn and the fifth shadow, which hasn't moved at all, immediately took off in a running motion and disappeared from view. This startled all of us when we ran back down the hill to our parents in the fire. Not sure what it was that we saw but it definitely freaked us out, and it's something we still bring up every now and then. We're still a little spooked by it. Two years of misery. In parentheses, long. Myself and my partner rented out our first house back in 2012. Nothing creepy or particularly off-putting about it. Just a standard terraced house on a street of an identical house in the northern town of England. My partner and now wife was pregnant at the time, so we needed somewhere to bring up our first child. We chose this one as it was in the area that we were familiar with, and the rent was affordable. When we first moved in, everything was normal. Just a standard house. We set about getting furnishings and all the usual stuff. I used to take my wife to work early in the morning. I'd drop her off and come back home. The front door opened directly into the living room. And there was a sliding door from this room which led into the kitchen. This had a door going out the back to an enclosed yard. It was shared with nearby houses and the stairs leading upstairs. There was also a frosted glass window next to the sliding door, which was presumably once a serving hatch, but now it just served to let some natural light in as sun never got to the front of the house, and that was due to the narrow street and the surrounding houses. Within a few weeks of moving in, I developed a weird feeling, like 
like something was watching me through the window. It wasn't overpowering, but it did get to the point whereby I'd actively avoid looking at it in the corner of my eye. Some part of me always worried I might see something on the other side looking back. I'd always been deeply skeptical of anything paranormal, so I always tried to ignore it or laugh it off. Maybe it was just me being stupid. That said, the feeling became stronger to the point that after dropping my wife at work, I'd come home and catch a few hours on the sofa in the living room as I didn't want to go into the kitchen and upstairs to bed. The feeling was definitely strongest in the kitchen. Maybe on the stairs, too. The only way I can describe it is it felt predatory. Like the constant nagging feeling that something was either watching you or right over your shoulder about to rush you, even though there's nothing there. Things seriously escalated after one particular evening. We were watching a Darren Brown TV show, whereby he was disproving the idea of paranormal and seances. Part of the show asked you to perform a Ouija board at home. The premise was that he would lead the responses, tell you what results you would get, thereby removing any idea of it being anything more than suggestion and parlor trick. My skeptical nature combined with my wife's belief in the paranormal meant that I was keen to go along with this. You know, to prove how her beliefs were silly. We started the Ouija board, went along with all the instructions, except we didn't get the results the show said we would. We got something far more sinister. When we asked the name of any spirit, rather than the scripted name we were supposed to get, we got the name Ernest. By this point I'm laughing, thinking my wife is pranking me. Ernest is a stupid name to come up with. My wife isn't laughing, though. She says that we should stop. Thinking that it's all her, I go along with it. Do you like living here, Ernest? No. Why not, Ernest? What do you think of me? Rogue. Now it's worth mentioning that this confused me. My own experiences of the word rogue were like various classes in video games. Okay, what do you think of my wife? Whore. Wife is getting more upset, and by this point, it's really quite distressing. We follow the rules, and we say goodbye. The glass we were using as a planchette goes to goodbye. The board we were using was made of scraps of paper with letters and numbers that, you know, with the usual yes, no, hello, goodbye on them. As my wife was so freaked out by this, I collected them together, put them in a glass bowl, and took them out in the yard and burned them, partly for her peace of mind partly for my own. That night we had gone to bed, and around twenty or so minutes after we'd gotten into bed, we heard a loud bang that came from downstairs. I went downstairs to check everything, thinking something may have fallen over. Everything was still in place. So I went back to bed. As we lived in a terraced house, I told my wife it might be the neighbors banging a cupboard door and went to sleep. The next night we went to bed. Within the first half hour of being in bed, the exact same bang from downstairs. This happened every night, no matter what time we went to bed, whether it was 9 p.m. or 1 a.m. Within half an hour we heard the same bang, always at least once, sometimes twice. We tried to replicate it, and after trying everything, we discovered that a heavy cupboard door in the corner of the kitchen, when opened, then let go, made the same exact noise. I was pretty intrigued. I was keen to find out what this was, that we'd never had any signs of pests or vermin, and the cupboard was fixed to a wall about six feet off the ground. I asked my wife to just let me set up a camera in the kitchen recording, you know, at least when we went to bed. She wouldn't let me, though. She said she either didn't want to know or didn't want to antagonize it, if it was anything. Things really began to go downhill from here. We would find ourselves arguing over the smallest things, having full-blown shouting arguments for hours over nothing. Despite normally being a very chilled-out person, often accused of being too laid back, 
found myself constantly on edge in a combination of what I can only describe as anger and anxiety. This didn't happen overnight, and it was something that built up slowly with both of us, to the point I didn't notice it was happening until much later. There was no waking up to a different person moment, but a slow and subtle change. Despite never having had before, I begun suffering nightmares on a regular basis. I would have vivid dreams of family members dying in horrific ways such as being burned alive. I would wake up screaming or in tears. My wife would have to spend an hour reassuring me that they weren't real and calming me down. Most disturbing was she said that she'd wake up and toss and turn due to being heavily pregnant. I'd be laid there with my eyes wide open staring blankly. You know, kind of like I was asleep. But my eyes would be open and when she told me to close them, I would, with no other reaction or comment. I have absolutely no recollection of ever doing this, and I've never done this at any point before since living in that place. The arguments continued and got worse. The regular bang at night continued, and the overall sense that something was following me, particularly in the kitchen and stairwell, became more and more overpowering. Despite my best efforts to convince myself I was being ridiculous and trying to force myself to walk slowly, I was clearing that flight of steps in three steps at a time. I was filled with adrenaline. My heart was pounding in my ears. There was a brief lull in activity in a month or so before our child was born. It was around Christmas. The arguments had abated, and we seemed to get back to ourselves. I thought we'd turned a corner. The nightly bang persisted, but we'd become so used to it that we just now look at each other and just kind of roll our eyes. My wife told me that the kitchen and living room window and the sense of being watched or followed was something that she was experiencing too. Then our little boy was born, and everything was okay for the first week or so, but the atmosphere soon began to change. The sense of anger and anxiety began to creep back in, we were starting to bicker. The atmosphere was made worse as our newborn baby would just cry constantly. Every hour of the day when we were in the house, he'd sleep for 20 minute intervals and the rest of the time would just be spent trying to nurse, wind, feed, detract, play, anything to try and soothe him. But nothing worked. We had him back and forth to hospitals and doctors so many times in the first few months. But inevitably, when we got there, he was calm and sleeping or gurgling happily. The doctors would look at us like we were crazy. I was beginning to think I was cracking myself. But when we got home, the crying would begin again. We would take it in turns to see if at night, but this wasn't helped by the fact that I was now apparently doing the weird sleeping with eyes open thing again. It culminated for me one night when I was laid in bed. I was waiting for the inevitable cry to start when I saw a shadow form in the corner nearest the window. It began to slowly move across the fitted wardrobes that we had in the room. I initially thought it was being created by the curtains against the headlights of a car. Maybe it was moving slowly down the road. But it wasn't moving right. The best comparison I can make is like that of ink being dropped into water. The room was dark to try to help our boy sleep, but this was darker than the rest of the room, like a very rich black. It seemed to have shapes like smoky tendrils coming off of it. I laid and watched as it inched along the cupboards and then watched it go around a corner and continue on a wall. I knew at this point it wasn't a shadow. Shadows would have jumped from the wardrobe to the wall, not creep around a corner that was facing the opposite direction to the window. I watched as it go out the door and onto the stairs. Now, if this was to happen now, I would have noped straight out of the room. But at the time, I remember being oddly mesmerized by it. It only started to feel any kind of fear after it left the room. I resolved not to tell my wife as we'd already experienced enough weirdness and being on edge. The idea that I may have just seen a manifestation would have probably upset her even more. It was winter at this point, 
and the house was constantly cold. It wasn't helped by how dark it was due to the sunlight not being able to make its way in. No matter what we tried, we couldn't get the place to maintain a constant comfortable temperature. One room may be hot, but the other next to it freezing, despite the heating being set at the same way throughout the whole house. The rooms which experienced hot or cold varied from hour to hour. The temperature would spike in a room only to fall again to an uncomfortably cold space about half an hour. We had a room thermometer for our baby, and we were having to constantly move from room to room to try and find one that was relatively normal. Unfortunately, I found the one place in the house where the temperature remained the most stable. It was the stairs and the landing. So I'd find myself having to sit there fighting the rising anxiety to run because it was the one room where a child could either not be overheating or wrapped in blankets against the cold. Around this time, I remember a dream quite clearly. I was talking with a woman. No idea who she was. I was saying how dark and cold the house was. She asked me if I knew what that meant. I said no. I remember even now when she said that life needs light to grow. The only thing that can thrive in darkness is death. It may have been my overactive paranoia or subconscious, but I clearly remember waking up with those words still in my head. Now, when I hear a lot of these stories, I often wonder why people just didn't get out. There's usually excuses about not wanting to surrender their home and fighting for their house. Well, this wasn't our house. We were renting it. And all the combined problems and weirdness got too much. We decided that we had to move. We found a house a few miles away and gave our place just a notice. It was the night before we were due to move, and in the early hours of the morning, we heard a piercing siren. We had a carbon monoxide alarm. It was going off. We opened all the doors and windows and got outside. My wife and our boy went to my parents while I waited for the gas engineer. He arrived and immediately condemned the gas fire. We had a living room that started leaking carbon monoxide. It's difficult not to think that without that alarm we could have all been dead. And the fact that it happened on the day that we were due to leave couldn't shake the idea that the two were linked or something either wanted us to leave or give us a parting gift. If you've gotten this far, then well done. I did say it was long, and I'd like to say that we moved and everything was better overnight. But it wasn't. The new house started out okay, but the nagging feeling of being followed around slowly crept back. Not as intense, but noticeably there. In this house, we all shared a bedroom, had a lot of stuff still packed in boxes and generally cluttered in a spare room. One of them was a bouncer for our baby. This was a Fisher-Price frog-type bouncer and had eyes on the front, which, you know, when rolled, would play a tune. Around 4 a.m. one morning, the frog tune starts going off. I immediately looked to the crib next to our bed, thinking our baby might have gone out somehow and started playing with it but he was fast asleep. I did everything I could to get to the top off again without spinning the eyes, knocking and hitting the floor around it. I tried to tell myself it was maybe the batteries, but this was the only time it ever happened, and we didn't have to change the batteries for the next two years or so that we had it. The feeling of being watched grew, only now was strongest from a conservatory on the back of the property. My wife and I had been through enough by this point, we were now openly discussing the weird feelings with each other. There were a set of double doors between the kitchen and the conservatory, and this one particular night my wife asked that I close them. I didn't ask why, but did so. About an hour or so later I decided to go out back for a cigarette. As I opened the doors, the glass-paneled French doors of the conservatory were in front of me. It was dark outside so all I could see in the doors was the reflection of the lit kitchen behind me. As I walked toward the doors, I see the reflection. Very clearly, it was a black silhouette of a person running behind me. 
almost like it had ran into the house through the exterior wall and straight through to under the stairs. My first thought was that it was somebody outside, but as I checked, no one was there. I stood there smoking and thinking. I realized it couldn't have been outside as the figure passed behind was pretty briefly obscured by my own reflection, so it had to have been in the room behind me. I quickly finished my cigarette and went back inside. I sat there mulling it over before telling my wife the next day, to which she said that she wanted the door shut as she hadn't felt comfortable about that room all day, more so than usual. We had a similar instance a month or so later which could have ended badly. Whilst driving and pulling onto the motorway, the interstate for our American friends, thanks. The slip road my wife was just all of a sudden jumping on the brakes. When I asked what the hell she was doing, she said a dark figure had just run in front of the car. There was literally no one around as the slip road was in a wooded area away from any built up spots or paths. I didn't see this myself as I was in the back of the car with her boy, but my mother-in-law was in the front as she said she saw it too, was equally spooked. Gradually since then the feelings of anxiety and tension subsided, but we eventually moved again, mirroring our experience of leaving the last place though. On the day we were moving, we were taking our belongings down to a drive. That's where the van was. That's when a roof tile slowed off and narrowly missed hitting me or my brother-in-law who's helping us. We moved to a house which, out of any, should have been the most haunted, having been built earlier than the others in the 1830s. This house, however, was the most tranquil, had no such weird atmospheres or happenings. All of this was around six to eight years ago now. We often walk past the first house, We've seen it come up for rent many times since, but nobody seems to stay there long. The funny thing is, we both said a few times about how when we see it on the market, we both have a desire to go back. We've even talked about going for a fake viewing just to walk around the place. We never have, but even the idea that after everything, we still feel an urge to go back is something which the rational part of my brain can't really explain. I'm so tempted to go back through all the old census records. I want to see if an Ernest ever lived in that house. But so far, I've resisted the temptation to rake it all over for fear of setting something off again. That, and if finding out that someone did, well, I didn't really know if I'd like that answer. I checked the town's abandoned school. Can't explain what happened. So I'm employed as a policeman. I work the night shift in a tiny little town. The population here barely breaks a thousand. Needless to say, I know the town well enough to be able to tell when something is off. Near the center of town, there's an old school that was there before they built a new elementary and high schools. The building is listed as a historical site. The building can't be demolished, but, due to asbestos, renovations would cost the town too much to be worth the work. The school sits within feet of the public library, and behind sits the town's fairground. It isn't an official fairground, but every year that they just sort of had a bull riding and small child shows that they put on in the summer. With all of those details out of the way, I will explain what happened. I noticed the back light to the library on. It's not normal since it wasn't all night, and it isn't a motion light. So I parked in the north side of the old school grounds. I walked through a fence. I had to pass the school to get to the library. I would stop every few feet and listen because the gravel was so loud. When I stopped the second or third time, I thought I heard a squeal in the school like a door, and at first I didn't think anything of it, since I figured it was just me hearing things. The town just replaced all the windows in this building, so I thought I would, you know, really wouldn't be able to hear inside. When I investigated the light, I just found all the doors locked, I was walking back around to my car. 
As I walked by the school again, I heard a noise in the building again. I stopped and listened and shone my light, noticing that a basement window was broken out. So when I walked up to the window, I looked down and didn't see anything. I kept walking and heard the squeal again. It reminded me of those damn bathroom doors in schools where the hinges were always squealing really loud and echoed. When I came around the corner, I saw two cats roughhousing in the dirt. They stopped to watch me, and then both of them turned and looked at the door. I couldn't see myself because it was around the corner. One hissed. They both bolted away from the school, which put me on edge. I know this school is absolutely not in use, nor are there any plans to use this school anytime soon. Also, the local kids and homeless don't come here ever. It's a landmark the city as a whole really admires. Hasn't ever been an issue with breaking and entering for a long time. So when I came around the corner, I saw the door and I walked up to it to see what the cats had run from. I looked for other animals, but didn't make sense because they looked up as if someone was standing in the window of the door. Not like they would if it were a raccoon or a dog that ran off without me seeing. When I looked in the window with my light, I could see a gigantic Raggedy Andy painted on the wall. I assumed this was the kindergarten section or something. I then stepped back from the door getting ready to leave. I heard whistling. It wasn't really loud, but it was loud enough to make me stop. That little voice in the back of my head was talking now. It was telling me I was just hearing things. But the dude that likes the dump of fear of the unknown told me to go back to the door hate that guy. So I went back and listened again. I know it was whistling and not the squeak of an animal or an object from inside. It got louder when I came to the door again. It had a tune, but I don't really know how to describe it. So now, thinking someone's in the school, I went around and checked all the doors, including the second floor door that I had to climb the rusty metal stairs. It was more like a death trap. When I couldn't find a way into the school, I checked it all over again when I left and I couldn't figure out what it was. The whistling had stopped. I even hung it outside for a few minutes just without the light on watching, just seeing if there would be something inside. They would eventually need to use the light to get around or back out. There was nothing after 20 or so minutes. So I got in my car, circled the block, and parked down the way with my lights off to watch for somebody to come out at some point. No one did and there haven't been any lights inside. Old Man in the Corner of My Room I have two younger brothers. I'm the oldest. All three of us have had this room at different points growing up, and it's currently my room now. When I was young... My mom said that I would talk about the old man in the room. Said that he would just stand in the corner. She said I was never scared of him, but that I was never really bothered by it. I would always describe him as standing in the same corner of my room, and he would always smile at me. I grew out of it fairly quickly. I would only mention him on and off for about a year. This is a fairly common thing and can be explained away pretty easily, if it weren't for the fact that my two brothers had that room after me and would also describe the exact same thing. They'd even point to the same corner when talking about him. They weren't scared of it either. My youngest brother was the only one of us that never met my granddad. He would tell my parents things like, Granddad read me a story last night, and Granddad came to see me last night but still pointed to that same place. I only found out about this a couple of years ago, and it was already my room again by that time. Both my brothers had stopped mentioning it a while ago by then. My parents obviously never mentioned it to us as kids, so we all talked about it without having any clue we'd all experienced it. We never mentioned it to each other, and none of us can remember anything as we were all pretty young. I don't really experience anything strange in the room now. My bed is currently in the corner of the room. We all said that we saw him. 
The only strange thing I've experienced since is breathing noise right by my ear when I'm trying to sleep. But I don't feel scared by it. I'm also pretty sure it's just something normal like the air moving around the room. I know that there are much creepier and interesting stories on here, but I just thought it was a little weird and might be worth posting. I don't actually believe my room or house is haunted by an old man, but it's a strange coincidence that we've all mentioned the same thing at different points. I'm certain that I didn't incept the idea into either of my brother's heads. I'd already grown out of it by the time my first brother was born and completely forgot about it. Edit There are also two other things that's happened in my room that can be viewed as weird. One was this touch-activated lamp that I had in my room. I would have it at my desk. It would just randomly increase and decrease brightness. The light on the bottom would turn on by itself all the time, which is pretty hard to turn on because you have to hold your finger on it and press pretty hard. It got to the point where it was annoying me, so I just decided to get rid of it because I thought it was faulty. Before I did, though, I decided to test it by bringing it downstairs in the living room, leaving it switched on all day and seeing if the brightness or anything changed. Throughout the entire day, it didn't change once while I was downstairs. It can't be a faulty wire in the room because it's chargeable. It would do it whilst plugged in or not in the room. I also made sure it was fully charged before taking it downstairs. I tried it both plugged in and not. I don't have it in my room anymore because it's kind of creepy, but mostly annoying when it just starts doing whatever it wants. The second came from my mom. When I brought this up to her, she said that none of our three cats would ever go into that room. It was the only one that they avoided. The animals don't seem to mind coming into the room now, though. A homeless man told me he knew about my mother's illness. At the beginning of my freshman year in high school, my mom was diagnosed with late-stage ovarian cancer. It was a huge blow for my family, and especially for me since my dad wasn't around for most of my childhood. She was the only parent I had. Okay, with some context provided, I can get to the actual story I wanted to share. It happened about three months after my mom was diagnosed. My school was organizing a bunch of Catholic retreats for upcoming Christmas. The retreats would mainly consist of meeting with missionaries. They would tell about their journeys and people from our school attending Mass together. My relationship with God and faith was mostly on and off for the majority of my life. I come from a devoted Christian family, but I lean more to the agnostic view of the world. I didn't really care for the retreats, but I signed up for them anyway in order to not upset my mom. She was already an emotional wreck. On the first day I attended, I decided that I would go to missionary meeting, but I would skip the mass to the rest of the people in my group. After leaving the school and heading down the road to the nearest bus stop, I saw a homeless man asking people for money. I have severe social anxiety and I hate dealing with this type of situation. So deep down, I prayed that somebody would give him money and the guy won't bother me. But unfortunately, nobody gave him anything, and he walked up to me. He looked fairly normal. He had a long gray beard and was wearing a puffy black coat. A rosary was wrapped around his right hand. He introduced himself as Marius. I'm Polish, and it's a pretty common name here. He told me that he was recently released from prison and he needs a bit of money. I'm not the type of guy who thinks that every homeless person wants to use the money given to them for alcohol or drugs, or judges them based on their appearance. So I started to look for some change in my wallet. While I was searching for money, Marius expressed his deep gratitude and also repeated the story about being released from jail. And out of the blue, he said that he can see ghosts. I didn't pay that much attention to it, thinking that he's probably just mentally ill. After giving him the money, he thanked me for it. He extended his hand for a handshake. I shook his hand, and then instantaneously he put his other hand on mine and said something to the extent of, 
I know your mother, she's very sick. Go to the church and pray. God will surely help you. After hearing that, I was completely dumbfounded. I didn't go to the church, but went straight to the bus stop. After that happening, I saw him maybe twice, and every time I did, I had the intense feeling that he was looking straight at me. I was riding on a tram, and I caught a glimpse of him on the other side of the street. After those events, I've never seen him again, though, out of the two and a half years of high school. I've never told this story to anybody, not even my mom, and I hate myself for it. It's because she passed away more than 15 months ago in a hospice. Maybe if she knew about it, she would have accepted her death much easier. Don't beat yourself up. My girlfriend and I saw something last night. Here's some background. My girlfriend has always had super vivid dreams and nightmares. However, they've always been relatively similar to real life. Included no paranormal activity until now. About three days ago, she had a nightmare which involved a monster or a ghost holding her up by her ankle. I thought nothing of it at the time, but now I think it's connected to what happened. I was at her house because we lived separately. We were laying in bed and we started hearing sounds. At first it was the obvious buzzing of a bug. One actually came inside through the open window. We both felt like we were being watched as well. Her room's on the ground floor. The outside window is mostly gravel. So the crunch of the footsteps is very noticeable from where she sleeps. We both heard what sounded like scuttling on the gravel and started to feel uncomfortable. She got up twice to look out the window only to see no one. I heard light breathing from outside. I didn't do anything, so as not to scare her really. Both of us were uneasy and felt strange. She heard talking that I didn't hear, went to check the window only to find nothing. Started to get late. She took me home. In the car, she told me a lot of paranormal stuff that she's seen or experienced. As I was saying goodbye, I leaned in to give her a kiss. Thought I saw something. There isn't any good way to describe it. It was gray-faced, had very slanted eyes. Its body seemed to be so dark that it wasn't there. It had a large smile and it was the stuff of nightmares. I only saw it for a split second and said nothing to my girlfriend because I didn't want to scare her. She later told me that she thought someone was in her back seat. So she drove with the window down, music blasting, and kept checking her back seat until she got home. Earlier today, when I told her exactly what I saw, she said that it was what she dreamed about as well. This was the strangest thing I'd ever experienced, and I don't know if anything will top it. Her name was Catherine. So when I was a kid, I lived in a small town in Minnesota. Now I live in an even smaller town. But compared to most others, it was still pretty small. I was quite young when this started. I'd say about seven or eight years old. I was sitting in my bedroom on one gorgeous afternoon, about 85 degrees outside and a cool breeze coming in through the window. My parents were at the dinner table outside my doorway chatting. We had just finished dinner about a half an hour ago, and they tended to linger around to have a conversation. I was playing with my toy cars when I just kind of felt like someone was there. I whispered a small, hello. I was surprised to hear something respond. It was a girl about my age. We talked for almost the whole afternoon. And at about 4 p.m. I went to talk to my dad. He listened and was pretending to be intrigued, but blew it off as an imaginary friend. Her name was Catherine. She was hurt, but didn't know why. Fast forward to when I'm about nine years old. It's mid-autumn and my family's raking leaves. To our surprise, the neighbors from across the street call us over to talk. 
They asked us for some of the leaves. They needed some to cover their flowers over for the winter. We agreed. My dad stayed and talked with them. He mentioned my imaginary friend. He was in for a surprise. These neighbors were older. They had lost their daughter 11 years ago who was hit on the road in front of their house by a motorcycle with no known driver. Her name was Catherine. She never knew what hit her. We were shocked to hear this. And there was some resemblance that was pretty scary. The stories matched and every day since then has been eerie. Afterward things started happening and our life fell in a downward spiral. My parents had their midlife crisis. Our house was investigated. A couple of crews who both said it had a very strong presence, and that seemed pretty innocent. I was diagnosed with depression. My parents had gotten abusive to each other and divorced. I moved with my mom. We had just happened to have purchased three porcelain angels as decorations. Things started calming down and we started to financially recover. As for my dad, life was far from improving. It was my dad's weekend with my and my little sister. This was three weeks later. He was starting to get closer to an old friend of his. She had gotten him three porcelain angels. He had let them sit in boxes. He continued to fall farther and farther into debt and getting hit with harsh luck until the next time we visited him, too. We arrived at my dad's house. I saw the angels were still in our boxes on the diner table. I suggested that he open them and set the porcelain angels up somewhere as a decoration. He did, and as he was doing it, the air seemed so still. It felt like the whole world came to a halt to watch. They were up and sitting on a decorative hutch. After that, everything improved for him as well. I'm almost 17 years old, and that still affects me daily. I communicate with Catherine, and she's still not completely at rest. I think my roommate is haunted. My boyfriend and I have lived in our current apartment for about a year. We have one other roommate. We all get along decently well for the most part. However, right after moving in, we began to have strange experiences that always seemed to resolve around a roommate. Revolve. I'm talking about full-on, full-figure black shadow people, weird nightmares. All of us having the same or similar nightmares in the same night. Everything. It started with seeing head and shoulder silhouettes peeking into our room from the hallway, or from places in his room when he walked by. My boyfriend at one point ended up seeing the full face of a man with a beard. He stood approximately six feet tall looking in at us, again from the hallway. My roommate came in to me on a separate occasion to tell me that he had seen the same man without knowing what my boyfriend had told me. The strangest part is, is whatever it is won't cross the threshold to our bedroom, only his. It only mimics his voice. There have been multiple times now my boyfriend and I have been together in the kitchen. We'll hear our roommate talking, laughing, even coughing, and we know he's not there every time. Each time it's happened, I've poked my head into the hallway and found his room with the door open, pitch black inside. I do things to keep our space as safe as possible. I've heard coughing on more than one occasion from his room when I'm home alone, and like lighting incense or sage. I've burned incense and sage when he is home as well, but on more than one instance he's burst into my room asking if I'm burning sage. That's before I've even gotten it to light. So realistically before he should be able to smell it. He's told us before he used to hang out with people who used Ouija boards, and he openly mocked and made fun of the entities that were being contacted. There have been several nights where my boyfriend and I both have nightmares about getting our throats cut, We'll talk about it just to each other. Then my roommate would come in to me later and tell me about a weird nightmare where, his, well, where he cut his friends and families in his own throat. That one left me with a sinking feeling in my stomach. Anyway, so getting to what finally prompted me to post this somewhere. 
My boyfriend saw a shadow person last night. He was standing outside a roommate's door in the infamous...